evilest or most evil uh, thing or religion of all times. So I don't, I don't buy this peaceful, moderate delineation. You're either a practicing Muslim or you're not. And since then, I just associated everything evil, everything bad with Muslims, with anyone who looked like Muslims, with anyone who wore a turban, had a long beard, or, or even had dark skin. Or a woman on her own radical jihad, willing to sacrifice yet another son in honor of their God. Painting dangerous Muslims. That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. It's a frightening thought. Islamic terrorist training camps right here in America in our backyard. Human being in the world thinks that go f***ing Muslims and oh boy f***ing Muslims are the evil of the world. So. Yeah, exactly right there. Is a violent document. So violent it should be banned. So violent it should be burned. This is exactly what we have been told with ever-increasing frequency since the fall of the Soviet Union. Some analysts, however, do oppose this point of view. For example, Charles Kurzman points out that well over 99% of the Muslims have rejected the call to violence and oppose retaliatory attacks upon civilians. Unfortunately, this fact doesn't counter the myth that Islam motivates violence and incites terrorism. The reality is that even if 99% of the Muslims do descend to terrorism, their brutality will absolutely not be Islamic, nor their motivation seek its roots from the Quran and Hadith. The reason is simple. The fundamental teachings of Islam consider life in all forms as sacred. Yet Islam does not stop at this. The sanctity of human life in particular is accorded a special place. The right to live is the primary right of a human being. The Quran is the single most religious text that equates the killing of merely one human soul to the killing of all of humanity. Furthermore, from Islamic perspective, saving merely one life equals to saving the whole of humanity. Distortions through literal translations and ignoring context of the Quranic verses do not imply that perpetrating indiscriminate violence is justified as jihad in Islam. In order to help its believers to avoid inflicting any crime or any harm upon humanity, the Quran further adds several prohibitive and protective measures, including the commandment to not let hatred of a people incite Muslims into aggression, the commandment that made it obligatory upon Muslims to do justice, according to the Quran, and do not let ill will towards any folk incite you so that you swerve from dealing justly. Be just, that's nearest to heedfulness. And prohibiting Muslims even from compelling others to see their point of view. The Quran says, let there be no compulsion in religion. The question is, are we really under threat from the so-called radical Islam despite finding no evidence whatsoever of its core teachings inciting injustice and indiscriminate violence? Or is it the radical ignorance within and outside of Islam that prevents us from seeing the obvious? This ignorance compounded by the influence of deliberate misinterpretation of the core teachings of Islam is far more destructive than we can imagine because it holds people from seeing the truth.
And the truth is, it's absolutely impossible to comprehend the profound depth of the Quran from propaganda without delving deep into each ayah to reveal intricacies of the message. Here is an example of a remarkable verse from the Quran which requires us to think beyond what's explicit in order to discover Islam's guidelines for Muslims and its cultivation of human behavior. A deeper understanding of this verse illustrates how Muslims as true believers should be living their lives in service and benefit for all of humanity. This verse alone is good enough to dispel the myth that all Muslim criminals draw motivation from the Quran and other Islamic teachings. As the Quran says, وَأَوْهَا رَبُّكَ إِلَى nahli, Your Master revealed, Allah is regarding His message to the honeybee, which is a creature often overlooked as insignificant. The Quran says, In ittakhadhi, build you female bees. The feminine form is used in the imperative build or attakhadhi in Arabic. As the Arabic language differentiates between sexes, therefore the Quran is rather stating build o female bees. This phrasing of the Quranic command is in accordance with the scientific fact that male bees do not participate in the construction of beehives. Microscopes had not been invented until 1610, almost a thousand years after the Quran was revealed. The queen had known as the king until late 1660s when Dutch scientist John Swammerdam dissected the hive's big bee and discovered ovaries. Yet the Quran revealed such details over 1400 years ago within a single word. We must comprehend the bee in order to seek guidance from this Quranic verse. We must know that the Quran did mention other animals as well. However, this wahi or message to the bee alone shows that there is something special about this creature that the Creator wants us to pay attention to. Allah says, in ittakhadhi min al jibali buyutan, He revealed to the bee that it should take home in mountains wa min shajare and in the tree wa min ma yu'rishun and in what people build for it or beehives. In this verse, the Quran distinctly communicates a commandment to the bee in regards to the place of building its home. Beekeeping and honey products are a massive industry in the world today. Farming bees would have been inconceivable had Allah imposed the restriction upon the bees to create their homes within the trees and mountains alone. To seek guidance from this creature, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, by the one in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad. This is interesting. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him swore by Allah first because what he was about to say was really important. He said, a true believer is just like a honey bee. Here we have to note that first Allah informed us that he revealed to the bee. The Prophet of Allah then advised that to be a true believer, one must be just like the bee. But how exactly can a Muslim be like the bee? Interestingly, there lies great amounts of wisdom which we may grasp 
from understanding this creature. The Messenger of Allah swore by Allah first, then said, Bees eat good and pure. As we see, flies, for example, do not distinguish between filth and purity, yet the bee will search for miles for flowers which are superior in quality. It will not land upon a flower that's premature or decaying. The bee will also sense and avoid any flower that has been previously used by another bee. This means that the risk which Muslims pursue, which includes the job, the business, the earnings, food, etc., must be pure, clean, and of high excellence, as accentuated by the bee. Muslims, like the bees, must continually search for excellence, and those who look for good gather what is good. Drawing inspiration from the bee, Muslims must labor until achieving the desired good. Bees are extremely efficient and perfectionists. A large beehive can house up to 60,000 bees who may collectively travel 55,000 miles as they visit 2 million flowers to get enough nectar to make just one pound of honey. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Verily, Allah loves that when any one of you does a job, he should perfect it. A remarkable symbiotic relationship exists between bees and plants. Once the bee gather nectar from the flower, it abundantly compensates the flower through pollination as it transfers pollen grains from one flower to another. This is in fact delivering life to the flower in return for the nectar. Likewise, Muslims also must exert generosity with their love, attention and time. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, goes on to aid when the bee lands on something, it does not break or ruin it. We know that delicacy is another trait that bees personify as they heed the frailty of the flower petals and avoid harm. Thus, demonstrating the necessity of compassion and kindness towards our friends, spouses, and children. The core message for Muslims is to become a forgiving community who benefits one another and the humanity. Muslims must exercise moderation. There is no need to reach extremes in their doings. Muslims, like the bee, must avoid putting too much pressure on relationships or the environment. The process of making honey does not depend only on one bee. It's a shared community act. Likewise, Muslims are expected to take care of their responsibilities and work with others to create harmonious and productive societies. Muslims are specifically commanded to share their good fortune, be helpful and compassionate as the bee, rather than tending to harmful thoughts. Bees produce an abundance of honey, which can aid humans with its healing properties. When Muslims work in unity for the purpose of serving Allah, Humanity can be served regardless of the color and creed of who they associate with. In the very next verse, the Quran refers to honey 
is Shifa, which means a cure for humanity. What bees produce is a cure. Muslims need to be like a cure as servants to humanity, serving human beings regardless of their race and religion. These few examples of the fundamental teachings of Islam show that it would be absolutely naive to believe that Muslims would engage in violence against humanity and then believe that they are pleasing Allah, who has instead commanded them so clearly to heal humanity. If we have any hope of addressing the challenges faced by humanity, it won't come from demonizing Muslims or Islam or any other people for that matter. It will come from education, understanding, thorough dialogue, joining together in service of humanity and recognizing that we are all equal human beings. It will come from understanding Islam, rejecting ignorance and uniting even stronger against extremism of all kinds that tries to divide us.